Well, I want to welcome everyone and say happy National Caviar Day. I am so excited to have Lisa Simon here from Sterling Caviar. She is the National Sales and Marketing Manager. Lisa, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Yeah, really. You know, there is there is so much confusion, I think, about, about caviar, and we have yeah. talked for years about the, the really people's misunderstanding about the farm to tin to plate to, to pearl spoon, however we want to look at it, but that journey that caviar makes and the confusion that really has come from the repacking of caviar and how it is so difficult to trace to the farm. And the reason why I'm so excited about this conversation today is that we can really have a farm to pearl spoon um, conversation that is authentic because that's what Sterling Caviar does. So okay. if you can, um, which is, is incredibly unique, I think, to the space. So I wanted to share this um, with everyone, this, this beautiful, these beautiful tins of caviar that, that you all produce, because I think that they are so stunning. And a lot of people don't actually know the journey of this caviar to the tin. So let's mm -hmm. start out first and foremost by sharing what this means to everyone before we dive in because i want to talk today about that about the farm and mm -hmm. about about how there's been that confusion thank you thank you jennifer and also thank you for all your advo advocacy and uh, sustainability and really getting messaging out there across the board and all of the seafood industry um i think that you're um um really such a core um, necessity and important ambassador ambassadress and expert on 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 the topics of seafood and really um, getting conversations going uh, within not only fisheries as a whole but then through the channel to the consumer to to continue the education because I feel that especially in times of COVID or any time in the food industry there's there's so much there's a plethora of so much available to us. Um, on an international level, um, that traceability is of utmost and paramount importance in, in any food in any food chain. Um, so um, I'm excited to represent Sterling. Um, Sterling was one of the first farms globally to figure out how to land-based farm sturgeon successfully. So what I mean by that is Historically, the experts in this field, which are we still honor and um, and really kind of bow down to, um, um, were the Russian market and Persian market. And when I say Russian market, you know, in times of USSR, this has now morphed into obviously into um, uh, different countries that surround uh, Caspian Sea and so on and so forth. And I think with a lot of pricey, pricier goods whether that is um, uh, truffles or caviar um, and the like, there, there's a, um, a propensity to um, oversource those when they're extremely valuable. Um, and this was what was happening in the Caspian and why there was a need for um, more regulation in the industry as a whole and also a restriction on some of the types of sturgeon that were, were being wild caught in different countries. And so for that reason, Sterling um, saw an opportunity of both there's, you know, up, uh, after the 30 years in business that they're seeing this, this climate change over the decades in that, okay, first we went from basically a protection of certain types of sturgeon in order to rebuild stocks um, it's also that worldwide things were constantly evolving. So, you know, we've been in business for over 30 years. We have four farms. Originally, the U.S. government gave a grant to UC Davies. There was um, an ex-PAT um, uh, lead biologist that was working with um, farmers and a team at UC Davies to figure out how to successfully farm sturgeon. Uh, they borrowed some wild stock from the Sacramento Delta and they spawned the fish and then returned the wild stock back to the Delta. 
Um, and Which so is an incredible thing. So this is California native white sturgeon. Exactly. Which exactly. was nearly extinct. It was definitely, it was definitely on, um, on a, on a, a huge down spiral. Um, there was one period of time where there was caviar, caviar, sorry, uh, on a lot of the bar, bars, bar tops, like we would see pretzels and now we definitely won't see pretzels, but, um, they were, because it was something that was so prevalent, they were actually giving it away. And it was also available in a lot of coastal waters in the U S. Mm -hmm. um, so, so now the, the genetics that, that are constantly studied at Sterling, um, we've been complimented by UC Davies for our pure strand of genetics. And also in that um, there's, there's no kind of cross, and I would need our lead um, biologist production manager to speak more about this, but that, that within all of that spawning, that there's no, there's no cross connecting of, of, uh, of the genetics in terms of, uh, any siblings or anything like that. And so, um, so caviar is unfertilized eggs um, and it takes us at Sterling six and a half to 10 years to be able to produce caviar. Um, it's an extremely labor intensive um, uh, a feat because there's so many different facets along the way that need to occur in a perfect manner in order to be able to produce caviar. Mm -hmm. um, What's interesting to me about caviar as, as, a, as a food is that it's just as complex as wine. Um, in the last um, 15, 20 years, um, there is um, a huge market of caviar available to the consumers from all over the world. There's probably about 450 tons of caviar worldwide produced now. Um, um, and um, we are the largest in the U.S., but very small relative to the larger farms that are um, abroad. So we look at this just in terms of aquaculture. Let's just step back. So we've been eating caviar since the 12th century. This is mm -hmm. a historic food that um, has, has been served, I guess we could say, you know, these, these royal caviars, right? That has been considered to be this royal food for hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Now, fast forward, we have an issue with native sturgeon becoming endangered, and we find that we need to figure out a way to farm this sturgeon in order to have a truly sustainable caviar. So exactly. Sterling comes on the comes on the scene. They work with UC Davis and they come up with a broodstock without cross pollinating different um, strands of that of that um, broodstock in order to be able to grow these sturgeon to a size where they're going to be able to produce an unfertilized egg of quality to be able to come up with a high quality caviar. So produced in the state of California. Um, recirculating aquaculture system, right? Which means it's raised in tanks. And what you're saying is a 10 year process at the very least in order to be able to produce a mature egg for, the, for a quality caviar. For us, the younger side of that growth cycle would be six and a half to seven years. So that would be our youngest fish that we would be harvesting, but yes, up to 10 years. Um, typically, in each year's harvest, we have multiple class years that are going into that particular harvest. Um, and this is something that also we can, um, we can talk about how each farm is different in that color, flavor, texture, and maturity is what we're actually looking at um, in terms of the harvest. Harvest time will be different as it relates to each and every farm, just like wineries, the actual um, production of that caviar differs in each and every farm in, um, in terms of the, the type of sturgeon that they're harvesting. Some farms have, for example, borrowed, uh, or not borrowed, actually purchased some fish from other farms. Um, way back in the day, there was not, there was like handshake agreements between farmers and like some of the fingerlings from some of the farms in the US were sent out export and that was totally okay. And so then in, in specific uh, like um, uh, um, land-based farms um, that are 
that have propagated with some white sturgeon that you might see export most likely have had some fingerlings from California, you know, in a very long time ago. Um, but it, orig it originates here and that's where it's, it's really most native and most local. It's kind of like saying, you know, you're, you're cloning, you're taking a clone from France and you're putting it in, in Napa Valley. And that's kind of the relevance to when you have different types of sturgeon that were more native somewhere else. Um, so in addition to that, I would say relative to a winemaker, we have a caviar master who tastes, who tastes, excuse me, um, at harvest each and every, um, uh, each and every sack of fish as it's going through a process. So when they first remove the sack, they gently um, put it over a sieve um, and, and, and um, just like rub it gently and basically get off any of the fat. Um, it gets um, put through a rinse cycle, um, it gets salted, it, it, it dries out, um, and then it gets tasted by the caviar master. So let's step back just one second because, mm -hmm. because we want to make sure that everyone understands this sturgeon's mm -hmm. not going to live through this process because we're, we're going to, we're basically going to kill the sturgeon. We're going to remove that sack. That's a female. And you actually will then sell that meat, correct? Which yes. is a pretty yes. important process. So from Sterling, you can buy both this beautiful sturgeon meat. We've seen it on menus, whether it's at Pacific Catch Restaurant Group or others, really, really stunning meat. And then we also get these different eggs, which are going to go through this process, which is gently removing the egg sac, gently making sure that there's no fat coating, rinsing it, being able to, because obviously these are so delicate, and then salting it, which is part of that brininess that you get on the palate, and then having this caviar master taste, test, and look through it in order to be able to see what the quality is. And what quality are we looking for? Because you're seeing the picture I put on the screen, these gorgeous images from Eric Wolfinger. Tell us a little bit about what we're looking for when we're looking at the different types of caviar, because some of these eggs are very small. Some of these eggs are larger. There's color variation. Tell us about that as we're all looking at it. Thank you, Jennifer. And also, you know, kudos to Eric Wolfinger, who's just, you know, his, his mastery with all of his creatives and, and photography really is, I would say the best representation of photography that I've seen in caviar because caviar is so difficult to photograph its nuances. And I think he captures it beautifully here. Um, so going back to when we talk about color, flavor, texture, and, and maturity, at this point in time, um, I think we were working with different, different ages of caviar. Um, but as well, the different grades. So for us at Sterling, and each farm has its own grading system. And then when we send it out to distributors, and we can, we can talk about this uh, later, when we send it out to distributors, they may have their own grading system, which, so that we would call that a regrade. It's regraded by the distributor. And so, so that's important. So the farm is gonna grade it, but then it's going to be packed into so you've got it packed into larger tins it's going to go to the distributor they're going to open it up and then they're going to take a look now at the point where you pack it the shelf life on it is how long in those large oh, tins it's okay oh, it's oh, and then it goes to the distributor and it's going to get opened up and they're going to retaste it and grade it according to their system correct exactly yeah so, and so what does that do to the shelf life at that point when that tin is open so because we're only, we only uh, preserve in salt, uh -huh. um, we recommend when we re repack it at the farm, four weeks. Got it. Um, I have done home testing of that four weeks and actually pushed it to six weeks. But we, you know, it's a perishable item. It's meant to be consumed super fresh. Mm -hmm. it's pasteurized, which we do not do at Sterling. We send it to distributors when we have requests for that. Um, pasteurization can prolong it three months. Okay, great. Typically, if you see it in a big box store, most likely your caviar was, was uh, pasteurized. Okay. Um, not, not always, but you really that's up to the consumer to kind of really look at it and ask the, um, uh, the fish buyer because it's an important uh, you know, 
thing that you want to know before you take your attend home. So now it's changed hands, which we know in fish and seafood, it's really tough to be able to follow that fish. So now mm -hmm. we've sent it to the distributor, they're opening it, they're regrading it, and they're probably packing it in their own packaging, correct? Yes, yes. So, so by law, what they need to um, advise is that this is white sturgeon. Mm -hmm. This is coming from the US. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I would like to see even more detail um, on that. We have some distributors who kindly um, um, put on their label, farmed by sterling caviar, because we believe just like wine has appellations, it's important to name where you're getting it from specifically in the United States. You can actually find white sturgeon farmed out of Idaho um, mm -hmm. and California. So it would be nice to have the differential. Um, Relative to the, to, and I wanted to address what you were asking um, earlier. When we grade, so our, our top grade is Imperial. Imperial typically in any farm when you're speaking about golden eggs, golden eggs is like Willy Wonka's golden ticket. It's something that's <laughs> that you find. You only know it's coming like when you open the, 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 the sack. Um, and we get about 25 kilos to 11 and a half tons of production of caviar. Wow. And so um, that grade is really specific to its color. Mm -hmm. Even its flavor profile can, can sometimes vary. But what you'll often find and what Sterling, I think, has been known for is the creamy, buttery aspect of our, of our caviar. Um, in... in at least three of our grades, you'll see a color differential, um, brown, dark brown, light brown, um, and black. Sometimes I've actually seen grayish black eggs. Sometimes I see what I often refer to as like a bullseye in caviar. And I've actually noticed that when I'm on Instagram looking at beluga harvests abroad, um, that they often see uh, bullseye. And sometimes there's this interesting anomaly of what we call two color, but it's almost like a translucent. So it could be a translucent black to a lighter uh, black or light brown, dark brown, um, or a greenish brown to a brown. Um, and so two color like Imperial is really, um, it's really all about the color. So let's talk about the flavors of each one of these because you um, uh, are such an incredible taster. And so Thank what you. are we looking at um, when we look at um, the black egg in terms of the flavor profile? What could someone expect from that? So it's difficult to assess, of course, what you would, what your expectation would be solely by looking at the color. Mm -hmm. um, what you'll find um, in my experience with Sterling is that Supreme is often a firmer uh, egg on the palate um, and has almost um, a hazelnutty or a nutty flavor as it ages. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also finishing with um, some of that uh, slight creaminess on the finish and, um, and sometimes uh, um, a slight minerality to it. Mm -hmm. With Royal, I would say consistently across the board, and this is something that we see in about 70% of our production, Royal is, is going to be on the larger um, size of eggs, just like Supreme, mm -hmm. less firm than Supreme, but still within what we would quantify as a firm category. Um, and it would be fatty, buttery, and creamy. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just, you know, it's consistently a crowd pleaser. I think Supreme, it, Supreme is the sommelier's um, uh, caviar, and, uh, and Royal is just, you know, it can really can go with anything. It can go as a topping on any prepared dish. It can go on its own. I think it's very versatile, and, and it's definitely one of our uh, largest, um, uh, like, um, sellers, uh, mm -hmm. biggest, biggest sellers, sorry. Um, classic, classic is fun, I think, to experiment with. Um, on on different food items, classic has that umami brininess of you know what you would experience with with an oyster. Although I find oysters have that um, variant uh, taste profile as well, um, but I definitely think that uh, classic classic is if you 
if you enjoy cetone flavors and you like that umami brininess, then that's a great go-to. Mm -hmm. uh, those who don't like brininess and are not partial to that, I would definitely recommend that they go to the Royal. Yeah, it's definitely a, it's a, it's definitely a um, more of a, a stronger, more robust flavor. So exactly. it's not, it's not going to be in that more mild category, is it? Right. right. Yeah. And then um, um, the original tin you were speaking of. So um, for those in the restaurant business, we're used to, um, ta you know, the oyster tag that comes on a bag that tells you specifically where that came from. And so our, all of our product is tracked back to its original tin, you know, and all farms are required mm -hmm. to do this. And so what our, um, our trusted distributors are purchasing is original tins. So mm -hmm. these come in anything from, so they're metal or they're poly, and um, the metal tins go up to 1.8 uh, kilos, and we usually start at about 125 grams um, of these. And so um, these are the ones that basically the repacks come from. Once, once these are aerated, um, that's when time starts ticking. Yep. So it's kind of, I, I relate it to opening a bottle of wine. You know, when you're some, um, some experts in the industry now, when they're using their Coravin to inject into the wine uh, for expensive wines, they're doing that so that they can actually save that bottle and continue to re-pour out of it. We don't have that, um, that liberty. Once we open this, it needs to be repacked and vacuum sealed in order to um, send it out for four week shelf life. Again, I've seen, you know, I've seen a lot of distributors quote additional time on the four week shelf life. Um, and and um, if it's six to eight weeks, you know, they've, they've, they've tested that for themselves. And I think it you know, really depends on um, the salt content and, and what's going on. Once, once the repack is sent out, oh, sorry get back mm -hmm. so this so these tins so out of the egg sac depending on what the best packing would be to pack that all into the grade that it's supposed to be uh just say that that equates to six tins in different sizes they're all labeled with that uh, go, tracking it back to the fish id you know the number of the fish and then um when we hear from our distributors oh we really like that that, that lot or that tin, we track it back and we, we pull samples of sister tins and we, you know, we, we do lab analysis and we're, we're always curious to know how, how we can engage with our distributors, you know, or our consumers well and what they are, um, what they're expressing so that we're learning from it because it's learning an and learning about those flavors. Now let's talk about all of the different uses because we've talked about the fact that Caviar can really be an accompaniment. It doesn't just have to be uh, for, uh, you know, a first course, very elegant, you know, caviar service. So, so let's talk about that because I think there are so many opportunities for all of us to enjoy caviar in different ways. And what are some of the favorites that you have? If I'm buying a tin and I'm thinking of using it, having it be more of an everyday accompaniment, what kinds of things do you like with the caviar? French fries. <laughs> yeah, French fries, <laughs> exactly. Pizza. <laughs> Pizza. I mean, Eric's got it here on a little, like as a little topping with soup, right? And and our and uh and asparagus. This is delicious. I loved that soup recipe, and yeah, he incorporated these different um, uh, experiences. I felt like from some of the restaurants that I really enjoy, you know, Tartine in San Francisco or. Um, I think uh, um, Zuni, right? And some of yeah. the some of the things that it just it, it brings me back to my favorite occasions um, with caviar. I was I was um, I was really excited as a kid when you know once a year I would get to go out to fine dining establishments in Manhattan with my parents as a birthday gift, and uh, uh, I think it was um, Oriole and some of these some of these um, longstanding restaurants in Manhattan would put it on an oyster and, and things like that. 
potatoes. Th this this waffle was was genius to put this it. This waffle is 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 so genius. This is a tater tot waffle. I actually wrote a recipe. I'm going to be sharing it with everyone today, so they should be looking for that um, one that I had written for the photo shoot specifically. That's just Orida tater tots into the waffle iron with a little creme fraiche and an accompaniment mm -hmm. of the caviar, and that that really just shows that you can find this, you can use it in all different types of applications in order to start to bring this. Um, I think that is really the goal of what Sterling's wanted to do is, is really kind of uh, make this more of a part of our pantry, because depending on the grade that you're buying, it is more or less affordable and you can really start to incorporate it because a little goes a really long way. And so whether it's sprinkled over the waffle or it's put over those hard boiled eggs, it's just an incredible way in which to start to get a taste for this and to make things feel a little bit more festive, whether it's on eggs or, mm -hmm. or on that waffle. Tell us how to find you um, with this last couple minutes that we have left. Tell us how to find you and, and of course, um, how to uh, what, you know, get on the website and be able to get your caviar. Thank you. Well, to reach me personally, uh, sales at sterlingcaviar.com or lisa.simon at sterlingcaviar.com. Um, all of the tins that we uh, repack are available on our website directly. Um, and then if you're in a, in a really obscure place and you need a recommendation for, uh, for a distributor that, that is a trusted distributor of ours, please do email me and I'll let you know about that. Uh, regarding um, tomorrow, well, today for National Caviar Day, uh, we put in a code CAVIAR20. Feel free to, it's 20% off. Yay. Order, except accessories. And um, if it's a 250 grammar or more, um, you can put in the code free tote and get an insulated bag to carry it. Uh, a little goes a long way. I, I did want to say, you know, we're, we're, we're really well aware that and appreciative of every ounce that we sell at the farm, especially in these really challenging times. Um, I, so for those of you at home, when you're sharing, hopefully you share, um, one ounce can actually yield about 20 uh, small mother pearl spoons. Um, and with all the recommendations that Jennifer um, put together so beautifully, um, you can definitely serve out of that tin for three days and for different um, accompaniments um, or as well for your whole your whole family. There's some great omegas in there. There's oh, a so good for you and so <laughs> delicious. So yeah. go to sterlingcaviar.com, type in caviar 20. Happy National Caviar Day to everyone. And Lisa, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much. And thank you all for watching. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.